Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to um, Remote Data Gathering from Factories. Um, my name is Dr. Liam Moore and I'm from the Munster Technological University. Um, in this training, Unit 6.1, we're going to just talk briefly about the MQTT broker and its configuration and how to configure it. So the learning outcomes from this lesson was we will understand the following uh, available configura configuration options for MQTT. We will look at global configuration settings, things like message persistence, authentication, security, and bridging. And we will be doing this, uh, we're using Mosquito MQTT software, which is an open source um, MQTT broker and clients that anybody can download on Windows, Linux, or Apple uh, machines to try out um, MQTT and try out various configurations. So if we remember that the broker itself is the central um, component of an MQTT network and all clients, devices that want to send or receive data will publish or subscribe to the broker. It's the broker that's going to determine how an MQTT network is going to operate as it's the central point of truth. It can be used to specify the port or ports it's going to operate on, what message restrictions, if any, are going to be in place for clients. And these restrictions can include message size, authentication, um, and so on. It can whitelist clients, allow only certain clients with certain IDs true. It can enforce encryption and authentication requirements, such as security certificates. It can create something called bridging, which we'll talk in further units. It can do data logging and so on. And it's all up to the user to configure the MQTT broker down to their particular requirements. So a configuration is generally done using a configuration file that the MQTT broker accesses when it boots up and uses it to configure its various settings. Shown here is an XML file that's used to configure something called the HiveMQ um, broker. So HiveMQ is a typical, uh, I suppose, production type broker that you might find or use if you were setting up your own MQTT, MQTT network. And you can see it has sets various things such as the port that it's going to listen on in this case 1883 which is a typical uh, non-encrypted port for mqtt a lot of times they use 1883 for non-encrypted or uh, 8883 for encrypted traffic and it's got other uh, various um, configurations here for example the max client id length is going to allow is that a number of characters um, and so on So for this course, we look at configurations for the Mosquito MQTT software, and we've picked Mosquito uh, as any student at home can download this in any machine they want and try out the configurations. They can download Mosquito-based clients to publish and subscribe, and they can, for the following exercises and demos that we do, they'll be, you'll be able to work along with these. For Windows users, uh, the configuration file from Mosquito is going to be located once you install it um, in Program Files Mosquito. Uh, I believe in most Linux systems, Ubuntu and so on, Mosquito comes pre-installed and you will find the files at etc. Mosquito. The file will always be called mosquito.conf, so a configuration file for Mosquito. So best practice when you're setting up configuration files. When you first open the configuration file, you will see a lot of different settings commented out. So the configuration files come with all the kind of uh, standard settings in there commented out so you can read through it and see what you want to enable and disable. The best thing to do is copy this file and create a new mosquito.con file with only the settings you want. So take the original mosquito file, call it mosquito backup.con for whatever you want to call it, and um, keep it in the same directory. You can use that as your master file, but create a new mosquito.conf file and use that as the one you edit. Then you can use the original as your reference for various settings um, and so on. General layout for mosquito configuration file is you're going to have your general configuration that controls all the global settings, message settings, message sizes, what you want to do for logging and so on. So here you will define um, maximum message sizes and so on. You will have a default listener. So this is where if you have one port that the broker is going to listen on, this is where you define that listener. And um, brokers can have multiple listeners if required, but in this case, generally you might pick one or maybe pick two. 
one for encrypted traffic, one for unencrypted traffic. In this case, the default listener, you identify the port and authentication if any is required, and you can add on your extra listeners as you go along. And then finally, bridging is something we talk about more detail later, but you can put in bridge configurations. That is where you set up your MQTT brokers to talk directly to each other, so broker to broker configuration. So if you have a broker in one part of a factory listening to, let's say, all your CNC machines, and you want to pass some of that data through to the other part of your factory that's listening to um, all your clean lines or whatever uh, machines you have, you can set up broker to broker uh, settings that only pass certain data between them. This allows a scalable setting, but also allows partitioning and bastioning of the data. It's also a good way to add layers uh, of security in as well. Here's the example configuration file for uh, Mosquito. And there's your general configuration, your default listeners, your other listeners, and your bridge options. And we will be doing a actual demo of this uh, shortly. So for the global settings, uh, put in your message parameters, such as um, there's a retain option. And if this is set, it will allow the MQTT broker to retain messages until a client subscribes. So if you're working in a really um, constrained IoT environment where not all devices will be online all the time, sometimes they'll pop up every so often to see if there's any messages there, the broker can um, be allowed to set up and store messages until a client comes along and subscribes to it. Um, Obviously, if you do that, you may have to manage queues of data and so on. And there's a bit of um, cleanup required and uh, management of um, the broker that we won't go into too much detail now, but they, these are useful options for networks with intermittent con connections. Then there's things like persistence. This will allow broker to keep messages with a quality of service of one or higher and save them to a file across restarts of the broker. So the broker, uh, um, trips out or uh, shuts down or for whatever reason crashes any message with a quality of one uh, service one if it's got persistence will be persisted through restarts of the broker you can add your message restrictions into the broker global settings so you can specify maximum data size which is a large packet the client can send in bytes there's a default value but you can change that um, if the client exceeds the maximums, then they will uh, drop the message. And if they're set up for quality of service one or two, they'll be notified of an error. You can have queue limits if you're doing persistent data or so on um, on QoS1 and QoS2 messages. Uh, and that specifies the maximum amount of data messages the broker will hold. Global settings, you can have your authentication. And um, this is more of a per listener, but uh, you have access control, the broker specify requires clients connect with a series of authentication steps. Um, clients should or should not have usernames, passwords, and so on. Clients should or should not be on a whitelist of accepted client, uh, clients. Uh, you can set all these up here as well. Uh, you can allow anonymous clients uh, if you wish, uh, and so on. So this is just a quick dive uh, overview into um, configuration files, a bit of a best practice and some explanation of some of the settings. What we'll do in the uh, next um, video is actually show you on a Windows machine uh, some configuration files being set up. Again, this project was brought to you uh, by Erasmus Plus um, and the European Union, uh, funded by the European Union. The project is called Remain. This is where the partners are based. Um, throughout Europe. We're here in Cork in Ireland in the MTU. You can look at this link if you want more information uh, about the project.